testing the audio levels on this microphone. We like it. And there we got to grease this process. Good afternoon, my screen mommies and poppies, my scoopies and my softies. Sounds like this mic is a little hot. Hey, can you please get out of the way? Sounds like this mic is a little hot. How's that? Is that better? There we go. Okay. Maybe we get this mic up a little higher. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> All right. Oh, still a little hot. We're still a little hot. There we go. How's that? How are those levels? Are those levels peaking? Pop, 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 testing. Dude, I will tell you what, bringing all this technology out here to the wilderness just is like kind of the antithesis of being outside. But, you know, do it for the gram. I do it for the only grams. It is fun though. I will say, um, much like espresso, the process is a little bit more fun than actually doing it or drinking it, if that makes sense. Like, I like pulling a shot of espresso more than I like drinking it. So, in this kind of realm, I like researching all of the technology, how I have this all set up. Oh, see, like, this doesn't sound... I'm just going to bring this mic over here. Like, basically what I'm doing is shit using a lav mic and then monitoring that on oh that sounds good on the headphones because one of my biggest pet feet pet peeves about watching youtube videos is the audio is messed up because the guy recording it can't monitor his audio so as ridiculous as this is having two cables going into the camera it's important because then I get to hear what's going on with the audio. And I think we've nailed it. This sounds pretty good. All right, let's do some questions. Hmm. But before we get there, let's talk about this coffee. It's from Ethiopia. Habtamu Fekata Aga is the varietal. It's a wash coffee. Supposed to be tasting peach, floral, floral, stone fruit, and earl grey. And it's from September. September Roasters. I, um, see, the mic's still a little poppy. Still a little hot on the microphone. There we go. Just a little touch. 
I was cleaning my grinder and I knocked all my settings out of whack. So I had to recalibrate it and I ground this a little bit too fine. So it's a little bitter. We're missing some of the floral acidic notes. It's a little muddy. But as it cools, it should get a lot better. That's one thing about coffee. People drink it too fast and all they taste is the heat. If you wait a while, in fact, the best time to um, drink coffee is like when it's room temperature. But anyway, let's get into some questions. We have a lot. Now, I do have some questions from last week that I would like to answer. Just give me a moment here. I have to go back into my archive. While this is loading up, I did try and shoot a little bit of B-roll. As we were walking out here for our first leg, we're out here in the Wissahickon doing a six-mile loop, 6.8-mile loop, the yellow trail. I tried to film and capture some really nice audio to set the mood. Now, I don't know how that's going to look when I put it all together and edit it and post, um, but that is that was the intention. And unfortunately, we have really shitty cell signal out here, and that could be a problem. All right, unfortunately where we are, this beautiful setting that I have for you guys, we don't get any reception and all of the questions are on Instagram and I can't load it, can't load activity. So we're gonna have to abandon this spot, continue on our trail and hopefully find a place that first has good cell signal and then has a nice setting second. <laughs> Fuck. Okay, from last week we have ghost, bear, mini dudes. Do you have a favorite French press, favorite coffee for a French press? So let's just talk about what French press will do to your coffee. French press is going to create a lot of body. It's going to have a lot of sediment. It's going to be muddier. And I don't think doing like a light roast or a natural or something that's like super special where the idea is to get all that clarity and flavor separation would be best suited for a French press. Um, however, with that said, there's no specific coffee for any type of brewing apparatus or methodology. What I would probably want to do with a French press is use something that's medium to darker roast and kind of intended for that richer body, something that's like got caramel and dark chocolate and nutty notes i think that would be nice and then maybe save your lighter roast for a pour over or some method that you can get flavor separation and really good clarity great question i love the coffee questions ah from dan gutter Ooh, we just popped the mic we just hit the levels hard we hit the limiter dude i'm telling you i'm obsessed with this audio is so important okay let's try that Get the face tracking back on. I look like Rambo out here. This is nuts. This is absolutely nuts. Hey, Sunday, come here. Come here. Hey, come here, sweetie. Come here. I forgot she was off the leash. Hey, come here. Come here. Come here, sweetie. Come on. Come on. Come on. Good girl. All right. Okay, sit down, sweetie. From Dan Gutter. Pizza Gut. Everyone knows him. And if you don't, you should, because he's an OG in the pizza game. I think pretty much you could safely say brought Detroit style pan pizzas to Philadelphia. He wants to know do you want to test your dough in a deck oven? And yes, I fucking do, man. I don't really want to be using the home oven because it's so inconsistent and temperature is like one of the variables that I really need to have consistency in. But I do want to, I do want to clarify one point. When you say your dough, I don't have my dough yet. I've been kind of cobbling together a bunch of different recipes to see what I like. I am squarely in the copy paste mode of this hobby. Eventually I'll figure out like what I want in a pizza 
like what my voice you could say is going to be like my ultimate doe and then uh you know that'll be a derivative trail off of all of the recipes that i've tried but absolutely i would love to throw any pizza dough that i make in a deck oven so if you're offering i would love to take you up on that um and um these usernames man i i'm really sensitive to the usernames because everyone fucks up my username they say 1900 ice cream it's 1900 ice cream so like i really want to get these right And I'm at maybe a numbros and um and umbros. I'm also dyslexic, so this is very challenging. Anyway, what's up? Oh, we did the fluff containers. Pipe dope wants to know, what do you do to take care of your mental health? This baby. Uh one is just doing anything that has a creative outlet for me. So hobbies, big stress reliever. I like to play with my doggy. Um and just going out in the woods. I love being outside. Being in the city is like a pressure cooker. And there's a lot of stress just in like the nature of what I do for a living. So being out here, although the technology does <laughs> take me out of nature, this is where I like to be. And this is what I like to do. All right. It's a great question. Um, con... See, I think a lot of these are like first initial last name, and I don't know where to separate the vowel, uh, separate the syllables. Hey, sweetie, come here, right here. There's a great spot for you, right here, right next to me. I made it just for you, little girl. Stay there. No, it's on a rock. Congoline eight eight eight. What's your astrological sign? I am a Cancer. I don't know what else more to say about that because I don't really know what that entails. However, I've been told that from people who know about astrological signs, I really do represent the cancer. Sit down, sweetie. Connor 2J. Is that 2JZ? What's your YouTube tag it? Well, buddy, if you're watching this, you have found it. I think it's just 1900 ice cream youtube.com slash 1900 ice cream just like the instagram handle grace carr can you make a de oh this is a, this is a, uh, a a tip a tip from grace carr you can make a degree symbol by long pressing zero very helpful thank you for that because i use the asterisk um 1900 very, very apropos handle you got there with no profile picture. That's interesting. I wonder if that's a burner account or who came to the 1900 first, me or you? Anyway, your question is, did you work in the pizza industry before 1900 or just a lover like me? I am just a lover like you, man. I started making pizzas back when I had my underground restaurant, Boku Supper Club. It was like 2016. Um, I messed around. My dad would, you know, my dad would, my dad made a dad pizza. He would take the Pillsbury, um, Pillsbury had like a, a sheet dough that came in one of those pressurized cylinders. He'd crack it and it would burst open. He'd lay that thing out, put it in a sheet tray and he'd load it up. There'd be like artichokes, pepperoni, black olives, um, fucking whatever else lots of cheese and he would park that thing in the oven and that would be dinner it was a dad pizza and i get nostalgic for it to this day i've made it however what i do notice is there's a bit of a chemical taste from the chemical leavening that's in that dough it's highly processed so it does have a bit of a tang to it i think that also might be the preservatives it's interesting how your how what you taste now as a kid doesn't really tastes so great that suddenly does not know what to do sweetie hey, come here if you just relax and find a spot it'll be better for you good question maddie carr is the pumpkin soft serve coming back yes it's coming back don't worry this is the season of course it's coming back it's a big seller megan t dwyer Pick of the Whole Foods Pizza Dough brand. Okay. 
I guess I maybe what I can do is in post, I'll like flash it on the screen for you. It's great. It's an awesome quick dough. Uh, my boring friend, how to buy a Japanese truck. So I have a Mitsubishi Delica L300 that was imported from Japan. And, uh, oh, now she's digging. And uh, I didn't actually do the importing. I got it from a dealer who imported it. There are a ton of YouTube videos on how to import a Japanese van. I will say, if you want to do it for like the adventure and, and like fun of it, then definitely do it. But I don't think you should go into it thinking you're going to save like a ton of bucks because there's not a huge spread between what you're going to end up with after like dock fees, import fees, uh, the auction and like titling and all that and taxes and having somebody just doing all that for you and, and you pay a little bit of a premium. It depends on what your time is worth. If you're looking for a fun thing to do, check out some YouTube videos. Um, I never did the process myself. What motivates you? Wow. Well, I am lucky because I'm kind of self-motivated. I was just, I was born with this little bit of anxiety, like a little bit of a fervor in my blood. I just got to like be doing something. Um, but I think what helps is I've really found my thing in ice cream and it's really become mine. And it's gotten to a point where it motivates me like finding a better way to do things always improving this process of like never resting on my laurels that is motivation enough like I wake up in the morning and I've been thinking about 20 different things about how we could do something differently and I can't just think about it I got to go do it so that's kind of the motivation um, obviously like you guys are a huge motivation when you're asking questions, that motivates me to come out here and, and film and, and spend my time answering them, which I love doing. But there's a there's a give and take. And I think having customers show up for my ice cream motivates me to bake, make better ice cream. Um, making content like this, if you guys are here asking for it and you guys are watching it, that motivates me to do it. Um, will you ever attempt non-dairy alternatives? Okay, a lot of people have been asking about this. And we did have non-dairy, but this is what I, what I have to say. We are, we are one nine hundred ice cream first and foremost, and we're very proud of our dairy. Getting to a point where we have our own mix that nobody else has that we've developed with our dairy, and it's very special and unique. Um, that's like our product. That is ours. Like if you look at all the jugs, they say one nine hundred ice cream on it. It's not somebody else's. When we make non, when we made non dairy only plants, is what we called it. It was just Oatly brand soft serve, with you know the the oat milk that they make, and that just didn't feel right. It tasted good, and like we put our spin on it, and we flavored it in cool ways. So we were kind of halfway to making it one nine hundred, but it wasn't one nine hundred top to bottom, and I didn't love that. And second, like. The non-dairy and vegan is a very loud minority, as I found out. So I, I rolled it all out, and we did chocolate sorbetto for scoops. We had the, v, the only plant soft serve. But it didn't sell as much as I thought it would for how, how much people asked for it. Um, I think we're just going to be known for having great ice cream, like classic ice cream, dairy ice cream. And somebody else can make vegan their quest. And, you know, that's, that's, I think, where we're going to leave it. All right, so we're caught up on last week. Let's go to this week's questions. I think we have a lot, so maybe we'll chop this up. What happened to the Choco Tacos? Choco Tacos was very fun. It was a very fun project. I had thought about doing this like two years ago and assembled everything that we needed. I got the little taco shell formers, but I never ended up making the Choco Tacos. And then one random day when I was messing around with trying to make cones, because that's another quest of ours is making our own waffle cones, 
I decided to just like pull out all of my tools that I had assembled for Choco Tacos and I just started making them myself. It was long after the whole craze last year when they discontinued and like everyone rushed to the market to make Choco Tacos. So um, then Choco Taco reached out to me and they're like, hey, we really like what you're doing with it. Let's let's do this in an official capacity. So we had a temporary license to make what the, the ice cream taco that we made to call them Choco Tacos. And we were the only people in the country that could do that. And that was really cool. It was a very fun project. However, um, they were very time consuming and I was the only one making them and I hadn't really developed a process to train other people to do it. Uh, it's, it's a lot of steps and it just didn't really work, fit our workflow. We would require somebody to come in to make the cones and then to assemble the things. And we just also didn't really have a great way to freeze them. I was layering them up in a chest freezer so it was a lot of a lot of effort. Oh my god, Sunday. Hey, get down. It was a lot of effort and I know it was met with a lot of enthusiasm. People loved it, but at the end of the day, um our ROI on it wasn't great and it just was it was too slow. So it could be one of those things that I bring back in the off season to get people in the shop. And that's typically what happens is if you see something that's very successful, go away. It's my, it's my trump card. It's my ace up my sleeve. And I like to roll that out for the off season. In the season, we are cranking on soft serve and scoops and pints and ice cream sandwiches, which we can build, we can make them in scale. Um, and we rely on that for the, for the season. Off season, we do the fun stuff. So maybe Chaco Tacos will come back. Milo Satan. I think you asked this already. I think I asked this already. I, Milo thinks he already asked this. <laughs> but do you go to concerts or like electronic music? We're lucky here in Philly. Um, I don't go to concerts. Uh, no, no particular reason why. I guess it's just not really my thing. I do listen to electronic music when I'm working out. I listen to a lot of different music. But I'm not really passionate about going out to concerts. Hmm. DT, oh, this guy again with it, not this guy again, like I'm annoyed by you. It's the handle, which I can't wrap my mind around. D Tarkov, um, will you expand to new cities? What's your biggest ice dream? I will not be, I will not be expanding. I don't want to open up any more retail if we do end up in other cities it's going to be through a franchise model or a licensing agreement and somebody else can open up the shop and hire the employees and, and sell 1900 ice cream and that that could be my biggest ice cream if what you mean is my biggest dream in ice cream it would be to really scale this thing out properly through franchising and make sure that we can deliver the same quality product that we do today and um give other people an opportunity to really share in like the magic of, of 1900 ice cream. I think it'd be cool to empower other entrepreneurs with our product. That'd be pretty sweet. Jeremy Soller, what's your process for determining which new flavors slash sandwiches go into production? This is just an of the moment thing. I don't really plan them out. I kind of wake up one morning and think about a fun flavor and I, and, I, and then we make it and we execute it. There's not much more than that, I gotta be honest with you. Maybe we think a week out, but it's pretty much I come up with it that day, and then in seven days, we make it. Seasonality does come into play a little bit. You know, there's certain flavors that are that we roll out for the season. Uh, again, from Jeremy Soller, chicken bake or double chunk chocolate cookie? I'm going to take this on face value that you didn't have a typo. Um, chicken bake or double chunk chocolate cookie. I love cookies. I think I'm going to go chicken bake. Just because I can eat more of a chicken bake than I can eat cookies. Cookies, I... It's... Uh, I don't know. I'm going to go chicken bake. Shouldn't be eating sweets right now anyway. 
kind of on a bit of a diet. So I should be staying away from that. Mark Hallbrook, what do you do with all the extra pizzas when you make multiple pies in one night? I freeze them and I give them to my friends. Strangely enough, this is exactly how ice cream started. I was making a lot of pints of ice cream. Um, actually, this is how the supper club started as well. Gave them to friends, ran out of friends to give to, and then next thing I know, I started selling the stuff. I'm not saying I'm going to be selling the pizzas, but I would be happy to give you guys pizzas. In, i got to figure out how I would do that. But, um, yeah, I only have so many friends, and they only have so much space in their freezer to be taking all this pizza. Um, Steven... Oberlander, what's the thought process for no scoops? Not critical, just curious for the business reasoning. Well, uh, scoops are pretty important for 1-900 ice cream, but the problem is Rittenhouse. The space really is not great for scoops because of how small it is. The problem with scoops is we offer free samples, and there's a lot of cost in that over the year. Giving away free ice cream, albeit little little tastes, is uh, the spoon, it's the ice cream, and it's the opportunity cost. In that time, that same employee could probably serve three or four soft serve cones. So it really slows down our transactions per hour, and we're giving away free product without a return. So it's tough. Um, I don't want to get rid of them altogether, scoops, but the space really has to make sense for it so we can bifurcate the line. We can have a dedicated scoop area and then an express area. Unfortunately, in Rittenhouse, we just don't have the space for that. So the thought is to make Rittenhouse just an express, get rid of scoops, um, do pints, ice cream sandwiches, soft serve, parfaits, and really build out on the soft serve product. And then have uh, Fishtown, which is a little slower of a shop, more square footage. That can be our like scoop shop. Great question. Quarter Soul Crisis, have you always been passionate about ice cream? Well, I think uh, always is relative. I have been passionate about ice cream ever since I started making it as a hobby. So everything that I've done in life has started as a hobby. So I detailed cars. That was a hobby that turned into me doing it for other people. I really enjoyed cooking, which turned into me opening an underground restaurant out of my apartment. Ice cream was a hobby. Ended up selling ice cream. So um, I have been passionate ever since I started. And that is pretty much how it goes with everything that I touch. It's a blessing and a curse, but I go very deep. If I latch onto something, I, <laughs> I get pretty nuts about it. As you can see, I'm out here in the woods. I got, a, I got all these wires. I got a crazy camera. It's just like... Uh, anyway, Grace Williams, 612. How did you start 1900 Ice Cream and why is it called 1900 Ice Cream? I think this deserves its own video because it's kind of a long story. Uh, there is a podcast where I talked about it. Maybe I can link it here. I don't know how to do that right now, but once I sit down on my computer, maybe I can figure that out. And it's called 1900 Ice Cream because this is a call back to like back in the 90s. I'm, I'm an 80s, 90s kid. There were uh, these sex hotlines and psych psychic hotlines, 1-900 lines. And I just thought it'd be funny if it was 1-900 ice cream instead of like 1-800 flowers and not like 1-800 ice cream, which exists, by the way. I wanted something kind of fun and cool and a call back to the 80s and 90s. So I was like, oh, 1-900 ice cream. Sucks because everyone thinks it's 1900 ice cream. Rennie Kravitz, what's the most discouraging thing about sticking to a standard of high quality? Well, I wouldn't call it discouraging, but the the thing with a high the, the thing with a high quality, high standard of quality, I guess you could say, is how much money you lose. Because you do something, and if it's not right, it kind of has to get trashed. Or the thing that you want to do is not easy, so it requires you to buy a bunch of stuff in order to do it. 
It's like developing new processes, which takes time. It's a lot of R&D. So there's a lot of cost in a high standard of quality, but it's a worthy pursuit. There is a payoff. So it's not really that discouraging because when you nail it, it's 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 a great thing. You know, you've differentiated yourself in the market and you can be proud of what you put out there no matter what it is. And I think people really appreciate that, especially today the consumer is way more educated. There's a lot of options out there and they really want to feel like what they're getting and what they're spending their money on, the person who created that spent a lot of time and put a lot of care into it. That exchange of I'm going to give you my money needs to be met with, I hope you did the best you possibly could for the thing you're going to give me in return. It's a great question. Elica.im, any soft serve flavors you want to produce but doubt would sell? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Fruits don't typically perform as well as the other stuff that we make, and fruits and soft serve are really delicious. But what I want to make and the style of ice cream that we do and the flavors we pursue are really kind of your your standard flavors, like right down the middle, all the good stuff, all the hits. We don't really venture too much into ethnic flavors or esoteric flavors like you know mustard, for example, but I also don't want to make those flavors. So I'm pretty much making everything that sells. Infragible, do you have a dream ice cream product you've you've yet to figure out. No? I don't think so. Uh, everything that we are doing, I have figured out. Cousin John 7, did you go to school to learn how to make great ice cream slash soft serve? I did not. Self-taught, I picked up a book called Hello, My Name is Ice Cream. That started my education, and then I got these like crazy textbooks. One was literally called just ice cream. It's like 500 pages of very, <clears throat> very dense material. A lot of equations and formulas, and a lot of trial and error. So I pretty much just taught myself through books. Pipe Dope, what inspired you to create ice cream? Um, I think we've covered that. Morgan, mo, 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 mo. Are you going to open a pizza shop? I am not going to open a pizza shop anytime in the near future. We did cover this on the last episode, so I'll link that here if I can figure out how to link. But uh, I'm definitely not going to be opening up a pizza shop in Philly, that's for sure. Austin Charcoal. What's a song you sing along to drunk? Well, I don't drink anymore. I stopped drinking back in uh, July as a part of 75 Hard. And I've just kind of continued not to drink. So maybe a song that I get really amped up for in the gym would be like Offspring or Smashing Pumpkins. Prof Beans. <laughs> uh, what vertical batch freezer would you recommend? I swear by Carpajani's. Using an Italian gelato machine to make American ice cream is great. The other option you have out there is Emery Thompson. Um, if you can get past the owner of Emery, Emery Thompson, uh, it's a fine machine, but it makes American style ice cream. It's got a really fast beater, whips a lot of air into the product. Um, and so I use Italian gelato machines because they whip less air, less overrun, slower. They also have a beater that's designed, two different beaters um, designed for a lower overrun product. That's what I recommend, but they're pricey. Minus Mob, what advice would you give to somebody starting an ice cream business? I would love to address this in a separate video, but one little nugget that I will say is find something unique about what you're going to do. Find like a reason, a purpose, a style, something different that you can call your own. I think that would apply to anything, but this should hopefully answer your question here and then maybe in a separate video we can go a little bit deeper because that's a very great question and I would really like to address it further. 
Uh, Turpin Star, full melt hash or rosin. I don't smoke weed. Mike wrote, Mike, Mike Rosie, are you a dog or a cat person? Can't be both. I'm a dog person, but I think cats are really cool. My friend has two hairless cats and they're awesome. I also like cats because you can name them fun names. Like if I had a cat, I would name it Chocolate Chip. Um, if I had like a, a big property, I would have maybe a few cats and that way I could name them fun things. Because the thing with cats is like, you're not really calling them all the time. They probably wouldn't listen to you anyway. So you can give them names that are a little bit more obnoxious because you don't have to be calling them that name all the time. Kimmy Wynn, how long is the process from thinking of a flavor to sourcing the ingredients and selling it? Pretty short life cycle. We have a lot of this stuff already in house. I have you know, hundreds of SKUs that allow me to do different permutations of flavors. So I can think of a flavor in the morning, we can pick it off the shelf, spin it that day, it hardens overnight, and then it can be in the shop the next day. So we can literally be like a 24 hour turnaround. It can be that fast. Robert Gomez, have you ever tried spherification added into ice cream? So spherification is a modernist technique where you add fruit to sodium alginate and then drop it into calcium chloride solution and it creates these little droplets. If you guys back in the day, again, my 90s, 2000 babies ever had Orbitz, the drink, those little floating things, that's spherification. I've never done that with ice cream. Could be interesting, but I will say those little beads are delicate and they probably get smashed in the ice cream when you're folding them in. But interesting. Jam Jamelia. Um, so I, I talked to this person over DM. So they basically wanted to... They're in Nigeria, which is sick that we have somebody following from Nigeria. They have an ice cream company and they want to do soft serve. They want to know a good place to start. And when I was talking to this person... It, I think it was kind of clear that they thought soft serve was something different than ice cream, and it's not. All of our bases from sherbet, 4%, to soft serve, 8%, to custard, 10%, to hard ice cream, 16%, are all the same formula, except for custard, which has egg yolks, except for the ratio of cream and milk. The added cream boosts the butter fat. So it's the exact same ingredients as our ice cream, but we run a lower butter fat. One of the challenges that you'll run into if you're gonna be making your own soft serve mix is the chance of it buttering inside the machine because your, your mix is not homogenized. When your cream in the States is not a homogenized product, milk is, and when you're combining those two together to get an 8% or 10% butter fat, you have a chance of that um, butter fat in the cream splitting out and clogging your soft serve machine jets or worse uh, getting little butter pieces in the soft serve our mix comes from a dairy so it's fully homogenized and pasteurized at the same time so all the ingredients go into a vat it's cooked to temperature where it's pasteurized and then it's homogenized it's run through these tiny little orifices at 30,000 psi to make all of the little constituent pieces from butterfat globules to sugar to water all the same size so that when you're spinning it, they don't tend to clump up and create big masses as cream would do. You know, like if you ever whipped cream, it turns into butter. Um, so that's a challenge that this person or, or anybody else is going to have when you're making your own. The one trick you can do is you can use half and half because in the states half and half is homogenized and oh a black squirrel dude i haven't seen a black squirrel in forever um i think if memory serves half and half is like between 10 and 12 percent butter fat so you can use that and then add a little bit of milk to bring your butter fat percentage down and then you will have a fully homogenized product and it'll work Unfortunately, she told me that they don't have access to half and half in Nigeria. And that's it. Those are all the questions. Thank you for listening. 
See you on the next one.